Now, let's think about some additional functionality we have. We know our service has the ability to add a book, get all books. Let's see if we can implement the functionality to get a single book by ID or delete a book. And if we take a look at our controller, if um, you feel comfortable in what we've set up so far, I would definitely encourage you to pause the video here and see if you can work out exactly how you might implement the two remaining um, methods that define the behavior of a book service and integrate those into endpoints here. You may have to do a little bit of research about how to actually um, parse the ID um, since we will be querying our API for a particular book ID. Um, but if that's something you're interested in, I would definitely encourage you to um, give that a shot. If not, we'll go ahead and set that up here right away. All right, so what we're gonna do is just below the um, endpoint which gets all books, what I'm gonna do is get a book by ID and we can use this syntax here in this case. This endpoint will be called get book. We're gonna invoke the get book on our book service and we're just going to pass this method a single parameter ID that should match our uh, string here which defines the particular endpoint. And just for the sake of clarity, we'll call this variable book. And then finally, let's go ahead and create a method to delete a book by ID. So if we're doing something moderately restful here, then um, if we're thinking of a book as a resource, um, anytime we make a delete request, the expectation is that that resource should get deleted. And so we're gonna use a, a delete verb to do that. We're going to call it delete book and we're going to invoke the book service delete uh, method, which is void. And then we're going to provide a message here that says book deleted. I'm going to say with ID. And use a bit of string interpolation there to return that OK response. Okay, so we have two new methods here. Let's just give them a spin and see if they're working as we might expect. So I'm gonna head back to the terminal here, rebuild and run our API. Then we're gonna head back here and we're going to add to our collection a new request called get book. We're going to query our API at slash books. And let's just get uh, the number one here. If I um, click send now, now we're just getting that book with ID one back from our system. Likewise, if I query for number two, we're getting the second book back from our system and we can update this as many times as necessary. What happens if we query for a book that doesn't exist in our system? Well, you can see we get no response back and the framework is going to send back this 204 no content. That essentially means that the success um, or the request was successful. There was no error, um, but it's not returning any content because it didn't find anything. We could um, configure things a bit differently to return 404 responses here, which is to say that it's essentially a client error. You're searching for something that doesn't exist. Um, but for our purposes, this 204 no content communicates um, enough information for the time being. So there's our query. Here is our response. I think that's good to save. And now we're going to add a final request here. We'll call it delete book. This is gonna be a delete request and let's just see what happens if we delete the first book in our uh, system, or attempt to anyway, and let's see what happens here. Now I'm gonna save it first, and then, oops, I've edited the wrong one here. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to copy this back over. We'll make this a delete. Save this, and I'm going to fix this one back here to make a get request. Our get request is getting the first book. And now we're actually going to make a delete request with the same URL and let's see what happens. 
Okay, here we get an invalid operation exception which says we can't delete a book that doesn't exist. So we know that's a custom message that we wrote, so let's figure out exactly what's happening. So we're hitting this endpoint. We must be going into our delete book method in our book service implementation because that's where we have an exception here. But what we're seeing is that maybe book to delete is null. Uh, and what's happening here is this throw isn't in, <laughs> isn't actually like in a catch block or anything like that. Um, and it's not in an else in this case. Um, we don't want to always throw. We only want to throw in the case where we um, have a null book. Okay, so what I suspect happened is the book probably got deleted. So let's take a look at get all books. And the other thing that we need to do here that hasn't been done is we need to call db.savechanges to actually um, persist the fact that that book has been deleted. So essentially um, the ORM is just keeping track of the fact that we want to remove the book to delete and then it's not until we call save changes that that transaction is committed. So let's come back here, we'll restart our API, and then what I'm going to do is make the same delete request. And now we can see the su success response with book deleted with ID 1. So let's see what happens when we query for all books again. Okay, so now we only have two books in our system and the book with ID 1 has been deleted. All right, so that kind of sums up the basic functionality of building um, something like a REST API in .NET Core. Um, there is much more that we would want to do here to really um, flesh out the functionality. I mean, it's a pretty basic API in terms of um, getting and deleting and uh, querying for, in terms of uh, querying for and, in this case, deleting resources. But there are some other things that we would want to do here, like validate uh, that the model is correct. In fact, uh, we can we can do that here. Um, for instance, I might say if the model state is not valid, return bad request. Um, but there are other things that we'd want to do. As I've mentioned a few times now, we'd want to actually use some type of DTO or view model in this layer um, that our service layer would then map to some data model. And we might want to think about some custom type of uniform response that our API layer returns, something like a, a uniform uh, service response object so that any client would have um, a known interface to interact with um, regardless of the actual endpoint. So for instance, uh, specifying, um, it, having an object that specifies like a success state um, and then has like a uniform attribute data which would contain the particular type that gets returned along with any other metadata that you might want on every API request. So there's uh, quite a bit of uh, refinements and expansion we could do here, but I thought that this tutorial would serve just to show you in general how you can start working with .NET Core to build out an API, to build out a web API. Okay, so now let's talk about how we would actually create a simple view app to um, be a client for this, uh, this API. So for that, what we're going to do is we can leave this server running for right now. I'm going to create a new terminal here. And directly in the root of our project here, I'm going to run view create, and we're going to call this GoodBooks Frontend. And I'm fairly certain that um, the view CLI may not allow us to use a dash. I know that it doesn't allow us to use a period, but we're going to give it a shot using the dash here. And no, it can't contain, it can't even contain capital letters. So unfortunately, this is going to look a little bit non-uniform. Uh, maybe we'll call it good books view. And so this is going to um, 
take us through this nice view CLI. And so um, if you have used the view CLI before, then you have the ability to specify various presets. What we're gonna do is manually select some features here. I'm gonna do, um, oops. I accidentally hit enter here. So we're gonna stop and then I'm going to run good books view again. So don't hit enter, use spacebar to select stuff. So we're gonna manually select features, TypeScript, we're going to use router. We're not gonna use Vuex in the scope of this series, but again, in my more in-depth series on um, creating a web app with Vue and .NET Core, we do go into Vuex. Um, CSS processors, sure, we can use SAS. And um, for now, we're not gonna worry about unit testing or end-to-end -end testing, but again, something that I go into more detail in my in-depth course. So we're gonna hit enter here. Uh, use class component syntax, sure, we'll do that. Um, I prefer class style syntax lately uh, in Vue 2. Use Babel alongside um, TypeScript, I'll just say yes for now. History mode for router, yes. And we're gonna use uh, SAS with, it doesn't really matter here which one. Uh, pick a linter. For now, I'm just gonna use ESLint with error prevention only. And I'm not going to have any automatic uh, linting for now. I do like placing configs and dedicated config files, and do I want to save this as a preset? In this case, I'm not going to save this as a as a Vue CLI preset. So once we work through that, Vue CLI is going to scaffold out a new Vue project for us. Okay, so let's see what happened here. So we have this good books view directory. Let's cd into it here. Oops. And there's already quite a lot in here. So I'm going to open up this um, directory in my IDE. Okay, here we go. I'm using WebStorm, but again, feel free to use the IDE or editor of your choice. So the first thing that I want to open up here is this main.ts. We have a TypeScript file here. And what I'm going to do is disable ESLint for the, just for the purposes of recording this. So in our main.ts file, we can see that this is essentially like the base of our application. Ultimately, we are newing up a view instance and mounting it to something in the DOM with the ID of app. So this is just a CSS selector for a DOM element with the ID of app. And we're rendering our app. And so what's happening here is we have a sort of a root file here that uh, Vue is going to help us use to mount to uh, some page with a DOM element of app. And specifically, it's going to render our app view component as sort of the base component for our entire application. And so let's take a look at that app.view component. Now, if you haven't used Vue before, um, this is gonna be kind of a quick primer. Um, but essentially, we have three specific parts of a view component. And our app doesn't have a script section, but generally you'll see it here. And this is how we'll build our components when we build out uh, the various components for this series. So at the top of our view file, we'll have this uh, sort of markup type syntax, um, which looks a lot like HTML or a simple uh, or a simple templating language that uses HTML for markup. So there are some sort of special things going on in here, specifically these router link elements. Um, these are of course view specific, but otherwise this looks kind of like HTML. I mean, we have this uh, template tag wrapping everything, but beyond that we have some divs with some IDs. We have um, some links that appear to be in something called, um, in something with the ID of nav. And then we have this router view. So we'll talk about routing in a moment. We're gonna be doing some very simple routing for this uh, example. Essentially, anything that we um, route to via Vue's routing engine will get rendered wherever we have this uh, router view. And so you can see, you can kind of think conceptually what might be happening here is this nav. This isn't going to change in this particular case as we route to uh, various routes in our application. The only thing that's going to change is what is within router view, and that's gonna get mapped by our router. So let's take a look at our router, um, and take note here that we have this home um, route, which is just that forward slash, and this slash about route. 
And so if we take a look in our router, we can see those two routes in an array with the name routes. So first of all, we have to tell view to use view router, which gets imported here. And then what's happening is it's saying whenever we go to the path forward slash here, I'm going to name this route home. And then we are going to map that to our home component. So this home component will get rendered in our router view. So if we go back to routes, when we visit the path slash about, it's a named route about. And there's an, an example here for route level code splitting. Um, we're not going to necessarily uh, worry about that in our, in our case, but you can see that essentially we are going to be routing to the component about.view in our views directory. So here are those two components. Here's home and here's about. Um, about is just a, a bare bones template. You can see that there's no logic happening here, whereas home has um, a script tag and some additional logic in the template. Notably, we are using this hello world component. So you can see that we can nest components within each other in Vue. Um, it is necessary that we declare their usage in the parent component or in uh, some component which is a parent of it. Um, and we can make those imports here. Um, there's a nice helpful comment here which tells you that the at symbol here is an alias to forward slash source. So this can kind of clean up the way your imports look. Um, so at any point, at any level within um, your subdirectories here, at is always going to be aliased to the source directory. Okay, those are the main things that I want to focus on for the time being. You can also see there's an assets directory with a view logo in it. There's a components directory. That's where our hello world component is coming from. And this has actually got quite a lot in it, um, at least in terms of content. And we talked about the other subdirectories here. So. If we head back to our terminal, what we're going to do is do yarn run serve. 